Okay, Bible warfare, how to defend your faith, lesson number four, the four principles of personal evangelism. So as always, we start our class with the rules we try to follow when discussing faith or religious issues with other people. Respect others' sincerity, even if you don't agree with their beliefs. And of course, this means listening politely while they talk and try to explain their ideas. The idea is that if you listen well, this will encourage them to listen well when it's your turn to, to share. Uh, stick to the Bible. Most important and productive way to begin an answer to a question is, I believe that the Bible teaches, whatever. I believe that the Bible teaches. Your responsibility is to give them God's word. Accepting that, believing that, acting upon that, that's their responsibility. That's not your responsibility. And then of course, be patient. You know, it takes weeks to grow a tomato. I, I, I only know that from books because I myself have never successfully grown a tomato, but I know it takes time to grow a tomato. Imagine how long it might take to grow a person's faith which is a much more complex thing. Your love is shown, actually your love is shown by your patience. All right, so we're going to keep on going with our questions. One of the categories of questions was that of evangelism. Several of the questions in this area had to do with various approaches to take with people of different religious backgrounds and how to become you know, evangelistically minded. For example, uh, some questions were, um, how do you approach people who don't believe in God? or he used to believe, but now they've become discouraged and they just have put that aside. How do you approach that person? Or how do you respond to a Jewish person or someone who's a Mormon? How do you deal with those who feel that they condemn other people if they believe, but their parents didn't believe? I know people, you know, they, they, they won't obey the gospel because their parents didn't obey the gospel, even though they believe but they feel if they believe and act upon what they understand and know, somehow they vicariously condemn their parents or their, gran or their grandmother who, you know, who didn't believe that way. So that's, uh, that's, also a, that's also a difficulty. So all of these are different people, all different situations, but there's some common elements to all of them. What I'm going to suggest here are some basic Bible principles that can be applied to all the situations. There's no single verse, I wish there were, but there is no single verse that says, this is how you approach a Jewish person or a Roman Catholic if you wish to teach them more perfectly the scriptures or uh, someone who's a Mormon, for example. The best place in the Bible to find information about evangelism, of course, the book of Acts. The book of Acts is eyewitness account of the establishment of the early church and how it went about in its effort to evangelize the world. So if you want to find out how do we improve our evangelism, well, look at the book of Acts. The pattern is there. So in this book, we see real people overcoming all kinds of obstacles. The obstacle of language or religion, persecution, immorality of great proportions, lack of resources, and they still succeeded in winning souls. Now, the questions that were asked all had the same obstacle in common, and that was a different belief system. So uh, how, do you, you know, how do you deal with a Mormon or a Jew or, a, or, or, or someone who's a Protestant, you know, denominational, you know, a Methodist or Presbyterian, or someone who's a Roman Catholic, and some who believe that, uh, that there is no God? In the Bible, we read accounts of Paul and others going out to preach in the world when there was no such thing as Christianity. <laughs> you think it's difficult now <laughs> you know, teaching, some, you know, teaching Christianity. We've got the Bible, we've got uh, you know, churches, you know, hundreds of thousands of churches and all kinds of resources. But when they went out, there was no such thing as Christianity. And the only people they talked to were people who belonged to other religions. You know, if you're talking to a, a Baptist, for example, well, you know, you've got some, a lot of common areas that you can agree on before you begin discussing the things you may not agree on. Or if you're talking even to a Catholic, or you know, there's some basic common agreement there. But in the book of Acts, they were talking to people 
with whom they had no agreement. For example, they were talking to Jews who held that the Old Testament at the Mosaic law was their rule of life and you know, that was it. They were talking to Greeks whose idea or whose um, direction or philosophical ideas were established by the Greek philosophers and they were polytheists. They believed in lots of gods, semi-gods almost. The Romans involved in emperor worship and then various pagan you know, uh, beliefs, nature religions, people uh, worshiped you know, trees and the sun and the stars, all these kind of things. Or they had goddess, gods and goddesses. You know, we read about Diana of Ephesus. So the names and the details of these religions are different than today, but like today, they didn't accept the Bible as God's word, nor did they know or accept Jesus as the only divine Lord and Savior. So we've been given no other plan or approach in evangelism than the principles and approaches provided in the New Testament. So let's review. God has given us information about this. How do we, you know, how do we, how do, we do evangelism? A couple of principles. Principle number one, prayer. Prayer. Before Jesus sent the 70 out, and then later He chose the 12 who would go out and evangelize, before He selected them, what did he do? He prayed, Luke 6, 12. Before the apostles began their great ministry of evangelism in Jerusalem, or beginning in Jerusalem, what were they doing? What were they doing when the Spirit of God came upon them? You know, the tongues of fire, and they began to speak in tongues. What were they doing? Well, they were gathered together in prayer. Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. Before the church sent out Paul and Barnabas to begin their great missionary effort, what were they doing? Acts chapter 13, the church was praying. And out of that exercise of prayer came a prophecy, came a word of the Lord. And the Spirit said, you know, separate you know, Saul and Barnabas one of their prophets, while the church was fasting and praying, came up and said, okay, the Spirit says these two. When Paul's ministry was roadblocked or in doubt, when he encountered opposition to the message, how did he respond? He prayed. Acts 16, 25, he's in jail. What's he doing? Praying? So prayer is the first step because it acknowledges the truth about each situation. And the truth about each situation is that God is the one who is in charge. And we are only the servants. It's like prayer, uh, everybody takes their position on the field. You know, like a baseball team, you know, they run out of the dugout, everybody takes their proper you know, first base over here, center field over there, so on and so forth. Prayer is our way of taking the field. We acknowledge and establish the fact that God is there and He's in charge and we're over here, down here, and we're just taking instructions. We're servants. And our friends and family need God and Christ and we are placing them directly into His hands through prayer. Through prayer, we remove ourselves as the force through which conversion comes. Oh, this is so important. <laughs> I'm going to repeat this. Through prayer, we remove ourselves as the force through which the conversion comes. The conversion is not going to come because we are smarter than the other guy. That's what I mean. The conversion is not going to come because our arguments are better and our approach is better. Through prayer, we place the gospel of Christ and the efforts of the Holy Spirit as the key elements that bring about conversion. We do that through prayer. 
I mean, it's okay to know the arguments. I want to know the argument you know, uh, for the existence of God. There are plenty of you know, various arguments, apologetics it's called, to defend the idea that God exists. There are plenty of arguments that you can make to you know, establish that the Bible is inspired by God. It's when we get to the point that we're thinking we're so fast and quick and smart with our arguments that that is the essence of what's going to convert the other person. No, then, then, you're, then you're dealing in pride. You're leading with pride. Hopefully prayer will help us lead with humility. For example, in Romans 1.16, what does Paul say? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And then he says, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Not my ability to formulate the arguments. In Romans 8.28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purposes. Paul is saying here that the Holy Spirit works to bring man face to face with the gospel in his own way. This business of God causes all things to work together for good, I've mentioned this before, that's not, oh, I, I got a great deal on a car. Oh, God works all things together for good. Or I found a parking spot in the rain. God causes all things to work together for good. Well, yeah, providentially God blesses us in these ways. But this passage here is talking about the fact that God is working everything together for the good of His purpose. Not our purpose, His purpose. And what is His purpose? Well, that all men be saved and come to the knowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So what is the Holy Spirit doing? He's working all things so that this good that men be saved you know, happens. So that men, come, men, women, come face to face with the gospel message. So when we're saying, Lord, please use me. Please open my eyes. Please you know, give me a facility to be able to speak to this person. Lord, please, you know, and we're, we're at, this is the prayer we're asking. Let your good come about. Let your will come about so that somehow this person that I love or that I know or that I'm seeking, this person will receive the gospel, hopefully from me. But if I'm not your servant, let somebody else be your servant, Lord. So, far, so for each question or case presented, I would say that you should begin by making that person or situation a regular subject of your prayers. It's okay to pray for all of China to be converted. That's fine, we need to pray for that. But a more effective prayer would be, uh, pray for the Chinese person you happen to know. <laughs> that one person you happen to know who's on you know, a soccer mom or somebody you work with who happens to be Asian. You know, pray for that one person that all things will work together for good. What good? So that person will come face to face with the gospel. Start praying that. And maybe God will use you. Maybe you're the one. Maybe you're not the best tool. Maybe you'll be the one to introduce somebody to that. I don't know. God works you know, in His ways. When we do this, we establish the correct relationship between ourselves, the other person, and God and we are creating the best environment for the next principle in the biblical approach to conversion and teaching, which is proclamation. When faced with a tremendous array of opposing belief systems, the apostles simply began by preaching the gospel. You go through the book of Acts and you read the different sermons and the, you know, the different you know, uh, speeches, if you wish, that the various characters give. Starting with Peter in Acts 2 and moving on to uh, Stephen and then Philip and then Paul you know, and Peter, of course, again. You look at their sermons. You look at their sermons. They didn't start by trying to explain how Christianity was different than Judaism 
or how the doctrines of Jesus compared to the doctrines and teachings of other religious leaders, they didn't do that. In other words, they didn't begin with debate. They didn't start with comparison. They started with proclamation. That's the first step in sharing the faith with another person, proclamation. Now, of course, th there's a time and a place, and this is what prayer and the work of the Holy Spirit provides, a time and a place for those other things. But when the opportunity comes, we need to share with our atheist friend, a Muslim coworker, even a Roman Catholic or Methodist friend or family, we need to share with them the reason for our faith. And so the gospel can be reduced to the following three statements. Number one, I believe that the Bible teaches that Jesus, the divine Son of God, proven to be so by fulfilled prophecy and miracles and His own resurrection, died on the cross to atone for all of my sins and yours too. Statement, no, no, it didn't take long to say, did it? Do we have scripture for that? Romans 3.21, but now apart, from, remember you've got the Bible in front of you, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God, that means His goodness, His rightness, has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, the law spoke of what God was going to do and the prophets spoke about what God was going to do even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there's no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. There's the biblical way of saying what I just said before. And then Romans 1 verse 4, Jesus who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, for the people that say, where does it say in the Bible that He rose from the dead? Well, right there. Where does it say in the Bible that Jesus, you know, this is the sign? Well, right there. God declared to the world that Jesus was the person that He sent and the definitive sign that He gave to mankind was not the miracles that Jesus did, even Him raising people from the dead in His ministry. It wasn't the walking on water, the sign that God gave to all men that Jesus was His choice, his, the one He sent, even though those are quite spectacular things. Paul says, no, 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 no. The resurrection is the sign, the specific sign that God sent to all men so that they would believe that Jesus was sent by Him. That's what Romans 1 verse 4 says. Second statement. My own resurrection and eternal life is made possible not by perfect obedience, but rather by faith in Him, which is expressed in repentance and baptism and faithful discipleship. What scriptures say that? Well, Mark 16, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. This was the passage of scripture that led me to the water. I remember Jim Metter opening that up and I read it. And he said, read it out loud. I read it out loud. He said, what does it mean? I said, well, well the person who believes and, and been baptized, that person will be saved. Is that what it means? But yeah. Are you sure? Well, <laughs> yeah. The one who's believed and been baptized shall be saved. And then, but he who has disbelieved will be condemned. And then he said, which one are you? Oh. oh, you mean this applies to me? Oh, yeah, 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 this applies to you. Remember, we're having this Bible study for you, not for me. And then, of course, you know, these are familiar scriptures. I'm not saying I'm showing you something new here. You know, Acts 2.38, Peter said, repent, each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 10.22, 
You'll be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end that will be saved. So you start with repentance and baptism and you finish with faithfulness. And then statement number three, only Jesus saves. Not long, is it? Only Jesus saves. He's the only person through whom a person can be saved and thus have a relationship with the true God of heaven. Where does the Bible say that? Acts 4.12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven. Under heaven means on earth, historically, physically. There isn't anybody else. There's no other character, no other religious leader that has been given among men. Given to, by whom? Given by God among men by which we must be saved. Well, that eliminates Muhammad. Yep. Well, wait a minute, that, that eliminates Krishna. Uh-huh. Well, that, well, among that group, Buddha would be in there too. There's so many of those people. Yeah. I guess we better get out there and get busy preaching. See, one of the things that destroys evangelism are doctrines that begin to include everybody into salvation. It sounds merciful. Oh, you're so narrow-minded, you, know, you Christians, you're just narrow-minded, bigoted, legalist, cruel, unfeeling, disheartened. And my answer to that, can I just open the Bible for you? Can I just show you Acts 4.12? I didn't write that. I believe it. In my heart of hearts, I, I wish in some way it wasn't true. You know what I'm saying? It's not up to me. But then I, I, you know, I say to the person, I didn't write this. God wrote this. He has his ways. He has his reasons. And I am not so proud as to think that I, with my small amount of learning, can change what God has given to us, which has stood for 2,000 years. Who am I to change this? I'm not that person. My role is to obey this. And if I want to step out a little further in service to God, my role is perhaps to proclaim this. But I have no right to change it. And woe is me if I undermine it. And then of course in John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, Jesus himself said to him. You know when you hear people, well Jesus, he, he loved everybody. He said he, He's the, he's the God of love. You know, yeah, well, the God of love also said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So Jesus himself says that. But you can't believe in Jesus and change his words to mean something else. You know, you've got to take the whole package here. So when you simply proclaim the gospel, you set the agenda for further discussion. You set the standard against which others' beliefs will be tested. You know tic-tac-toe, you ever play tic-tac-toe with the X and O's you know, in the little box there? You know, there's a trick to it. You know, if you put your X in a particular spot and the other person on the first try puts their O somewhere else, you know, and then you know, by the second move, you, you've got it made, right? You win. You got to know that little trick. Well, there's also an approach to Bible study and to discussion, which allows you to set the agenda for discussion and not the other person. And the way to do that is to open the scriptures. Remember I told you? You and the person you're discussing and your ideas and his ideas or her ideas, they're all on this side and then over on that side is the Bible. So that cuts down on personal animosity, you know, conflict. We're two people or three people and we're discussing our ideas and we're measuring them against the Bible. So the gospel message has power, Romans 1.16, for salvation because only it addresses the principal issues that all persons deal with 
whether they are atheists, non-Christians, or believers who require further teaching in the true doctrines of Christ. Everybody deals with these things. Personal sin and failure. Personal, it doesn't matter if the person doesn't speak English or doesn't even speak at all. Every human being in the world feels guilt and failure. It's a, it's a common denominator feeling. We desire to know God's will. And there is the fear of death and the hereafter. This is common to all people at all times throughout history. Instead of debates and polite discussion and comparisons of doctrines and practices, you know, worships, traditions, when you get the chance, just lay out the gospel itself and let the people deal with it, not you. They may simply refuse to respond or simply reject it altogether, and if they do, then at least you know that you've given them one thing they needed most, the one thing that truly has the power to bring them to God and save their souls, and you fulfilled your spiritual duty on their behalf. Remember, we're responsible for proclaiming the gospel, but not for the decision or the response. That's their responsibility. I mean, it was our responsibility at one time. I looked through this audience here and everybody at some time in their life had to decide, am I going to go forward or am I not? I don't mean go forward down the aisle. I mean, am I going to go forward in my faith? Am I going to take the next step of my faith? Whatever that is. And that's what God requires of every human being. Again, if you have the opportunity whether it's in a conversation, an invitation to a Bible study or worship, giving a book, a video, a bulletin article, you know, giving somebody a, you know, for Bible talk, giving them the, the online address for Bible talk. These opportunities many times are the result of your prayers and God's response through the work of the Holy Spirit. If you have an opportunity, the goal is to proclaim the gospel. If you've done that, then the next principle comes into play. You pray, you proclaim, you persevere. Note that in the Bible, Jesus and the apostles continued to preach and teach many of the same people over and over and over again. Imagine Jesus' frustration, you know, the human side of him anyways, he spent three years in close company with his apostles repeating over and over again the same message. The apostles, especially Peter and Paul, repeatedly proclaimed the gospel and encouraged the Jews to believe and accept the truth. You know, we look for some kind of silver bullet you know, that will convert each different type of resistant belief or disbelief. You know, we want a penicillin type scripture reference that will win over a Catholic or transform a lifelong Muslim into a Christian? Well, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. Even Jesus with His perfect teaching, think about this, Jesus with His perfect teaching, His miracles, and His holy life did not win over Nicodemus in one sitting. It took years for this Jewish teacher to accept Christ and then only secretly. And he was taught by Jesus. So our, our best chance comes when we begin with proclaiming the gospel and we keep the dialogue going by discussing how the various parts of the gospel affect or compare with the other person's religious life or beliefs. Of course, that's if they want to continue or to follow up on the discussion. If they do, then at least you're sharing what is truly essential and important. You know, better you get one shot at proclaiming the gospel than have 20 Bible studies proving that we're not supposed to use instruments of music in public worship. Even though that's a biblical teaching, that's not what's going to save the person's soul. There's time for that, absolutely. There's a time to be teaching the proper ways to do things according to the, you know, the word of the Lord. But we have to save the patient first. You know, remember I said once, in the emergency room, they bring a guy who's been shot twice in a bar fight. Now it's not the time to start you know, chastising this poor guy you know, about public intoxication. 
We have to get the bullets out and save his life. Then we'll be able to talk to him about you know, the danger of shooting off your mouth in a bar. <laughs> but first, let's save the patient. For example, the atheist might take exception to Christ's divinity, and this would lead him to deal with all kinds of, the, uh, of evidence that points to Jesus as divine. Both the Catholic and the Protestant and the Mormon individuals would certainly take exception to the proper response required by God. That is adult repentance, immersion baptism, lifetime fidelity. These groups would find something wrong with some of these things. But this would lead them to a deeper understanding of the primary authority of scripture over tradition or over church rule. The Muslim would stumble over the fact that Jesus is the only way to salvation and this would force him to examine the credibility of both Muhammad and Jesus to see which one is the true and final prophet. We need to remember that ignorance is no excuse. No one is excused from judgment because they didn't know or no one taught them the truth. Is that a Church of Christ doctrine? Well, no. That's Romans chapter one. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. That's a powerful passage. It's, he says, no excuse, no excuse, why? Because mankind can know God in two ways, from the inward witness, which we call our conscience, and from the exterior creation. You know, people look around and they, they ask themselves eventually, well, where did all this come from? And that starts them on the journey in the search for God. So proclaiming the gospel is the best favor we can do for someone and persevering in discussing and teaching them the details and the demands of it is truly an act of faith and love on our part. So whether they stumble over it or they're saved by it, they need to hear it as many times as possible and we need to first proclaim and then persevere by explaining it as long as they'll let us. Someone says, when do you quit? Quit when they tell you, leave me alone. Okay. I mean, if they say to me, leave me alone, I don't want to hear it anymore. I had somebody in our family once say to me, don't even open the Bible, I don't even want to hear it. Well, if, if they're telling me, don't open the Bible, okay. And we need to remember that Jesus, the apostles, and every Christian since has had a mixed response. Because not everybody wants to hear, not everybody is going to believe, and not everyone will respond no matter how many times you repeat it. That's their failure, not yours, not ours. And I'm not saying this in a smug way. I mean, I have failed many times. I mean, there isn't a single person, 38 years in professional or full-time ministry, 38 years, have not won a single person in my family or Lisa's family, not a single one. So you, you want to talk about failure? Yeah, I'll match your failure with mine. Principle number four, patience. It took the apostles 10 years to figure out that the gospel was for the Gentiles as well as the Jews. <laughs> the, at the beginning they thought, oh, preach the gospel in the whole world. Oh, that means go to all the Jews in, in the whole world. It took 10 years for, for them to figure, oh, oh, you want us to do for the Gentiles? Oh, <laughs> 10 years. It took the, the, the Jewish Christians 20 years to accept the Gentiles as equal partners in, in Christ. It took me 30 years to obey the gospel. 
Some situations and prospects look hopeless and they look like, uh, they look like this because we discount both the power and the plans of God. In the early church, no one would have thought that Saul, the crazed Christian hunter, could ever be converted. Not the person who was sent to him by God to preach the gospel. You know, Ananias, when, when, when God appeared to him and said, okay, I want you to go you know, to the street named Straight and go see Saul and you know, go preach to him. And Ananias, I mean, God has appeared to him and he says, have you heard what he's done to the church, Lord? <laughs> yeah. Not even the apostles themselves would believe that Paul had been converted after he was baptized. He went to Jerusalem. I'm here, look at me, I, you know, I'm ready to work. <laughs> the apostles were afraid of him. Barnabas had to take him under his wing and, you know, kind of mediate between himself and the apostles to assure them that, yeah, it's a legitimate thing. He, he's been converted. And you know what? It, what they doubted wasn't, what they doubted wasn't Paul's conversion. What they doubted was God's power. That's what they doubted. Surely he, he didn't convert this guy, this nut job that's, that's crazy, killing us. Sometimes we think like that, you know. My nice, moral, friendly, wimpy cousin, you know, yeah, I'll be able to convert them. Man. I just... But my hard drinking, hard living, get into bar fights, brother-in-law, twice divorced brother-in-law, now living with his third girlfriend. There's no hope for that guy. Why do we say that? Like Isaiah says, is God's arm too short? Can he not reach out anywhere, anytime, anyone? Snatch them? So what happened to this man? Did Ananias, Ananias did he debate Saul when he went to him? No. Was he impressed by the sacrifice and the martyrdom of the Christians that he persecuted? No. God is the one who dealt with Paul on the road to Damascus and prepared him to hear the gospel which he believed and responded to when it finally came to him. Now I'm not saying that God appears miraculously to certain you know, hard to convert people to prepare them for the gospel. What I am saying is that God has many ways of preparing our hearts to receive the good news. He works a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's the loving kindness of a Christian friend or family member or coworker that just impresses us so much. Sometimes it's a close call with death. Some people say, I don't know if my conversion is legitimate because I was scared to death when I had an accident, you know, whatever, I should have died. And that brought me to conversion. You know what, fear is good. It brings you to the Lord. It's what brought me to the Lord. I, I firmly believe that there was a hell and I was heading for it. <laughs> and that made me afraid. And the preacher showed me, here, here are the scriptures. This is how all your messy life is going to be forgiven over here. My response was, okay, where's the water? because I couldn't go back and fix the trail of tears. I couldn't go back and fix all that mess that I had done for 20 years as an adult or so. Sometimes it's the sudden realization of how heavy our burden of guilt is. Sometimes it's losing somebody we love and that experience kind of strips us bare of anything. We got nothing left. Sometimes it's the overwhelming goodness and kindness we experience that causes us to search. In these and a thousand other ways, God is continually drawing men and women, continually wooing us to search for Him, to find Him in Jesus Christ. 
finding us and saving us, that's his number one job. God's number one priority is to find the lost and save them and to keep the saved saved. That's his, that's his primary goal. The Holy Spirit's great work in the world is to bring things together to draw all men to God. Our prayers also serve this purpose. Our work and ministry are like signposts that point the way for those who have begun to search. You know, the first person that pointed me to the Bible was with a Pentecostal group. I mean, a way out Pentecostal group. I mean, they had practices that were really strange. <laughs> really strange. Not immoral, just strange. But from them, I learned, if you want to know what God says, you have to read the Bible. You think I would have known that being raised in the Catholic Church, but no. You think I would have known that having taught public school and having taught religion in public school. No. It was my Pentecostal friends. I didn't stay with them for very long because they were just, actually I didn't stay with them for very long because the more I read the Bible, the more I saw what they were doing was not in the Bible. <laughs> but they were the ones who said, no, no, Mike, get rid of all that other stuff. Just that you only need that. So you know, there are signposts along the way that God provides. So we need to be patient, however, because sometimes it takes a long time to bring a prodigal home. Sometimes they have to go to the deepest depths before they begin to search for a way out. Sometimes being patient and letting God do His work is the only thing left for us to do. If this is the case, we need to remember and trust that God will do everything to save your friend or your family member because, as he says in 1 Timothy, he desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what he wants. So regardless of the religion or the lack of religion, the best way to evangelize any individual is to follow the pattern for evangelism in the New Testament, and I review very quickly. Pray for the lost specifically. Put a name to your prayer. Again, sure, pray for everybody in China, everybody in Romania, that's fine. But put a name at the end of that prayer and proclaim the gospel. Don't start by trying to explain it. Let's get the story out first. Let them ask the question and then you can explain. Persevere in teaching and giving a good example and finally patiently wait upon the Lord for His ways and His uh, judgments are perfect, especially as far as His timing is concerned. Okay, well that's a, a little bit of information about personal evangelism and you know, how do you approach a Catholic, a Protestant, this type of thing. All right, thank you for your attention.